we'd like to try and cover a, a number of different objectives this afternoon. Uh, we want to begin by trying to think how uh, John the Baptist's work uh, was connected to Elijah's. We then want to look back at the historical record concerning Elijah and try and see how that was a preparation for him for work still to be done. We then like to consider a, a possible work with Judah. And by Judah, we mean the Jews who live in the land when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So, so we'd like to put that across as a suggestion and uh, happy to discuss it afterwards, of course. And then we want to talk about a certain work with Israel, the Jews who are scattered when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And then finally, we think it'd be good, of course, to try and take some lessons for our lives, to try and think, well, what can we take away today to try and uh, put into practice in the days until the Lord Jesus returns? So, first of all, then, when John the Baptist went before the Lord Jesus Christ, before his first advent, he was working in the spirit and power of Elijah. In other words, John was foreshadowing this great work that we want to look at. In John, we can see a type of Elijah's work when he sent to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And if, uh, as we're going to do on this next slide, you, you put up the quote in Malachi 4 that we've just read and where it's then cited in, in Luke chapter 1, we're able to see what that involves. It's, it's going to involve the Elijah getting the Jews back to the wisdom of the just. And the wisdom of the just, we'd say, is surely, is surely faith. The just shall live by faith. A theme which starts, of course, with faithful Abraham. And so we'd suggest then from verse 4 of Malachi chapter 4, open on your laps, I hope, that Elijah's likely to do that by teaching them from the law of Moses. And, and, and the other thing that's worth bearing in mind is that of all the people that, that the Jews would listen to, Elijah is the number one. There is still a tradition in the Jews in Judah and the Jews that live around the world that they'll leave a place at their dinner tables empty. And that place is for Elijah. He is the one that they would be prepared to listen to. And so John's work was most certainly a type of the future work that Elijah will accomplish. So much so that the Lord Jesus describes John as Elijah, which is to come. John clearly understood that he was not Elijah. When asked, are you Elijah? He says, no, nope, I am not. But we'll see that John was foreshadowing the work of Elijah as a voice crying in the wilderness. Now, I'd like now to turn to Matthew chapter 17, please. And we're going to skip over the verses concerning the transfiguration, although there's no doubt that they in themselves are very important. It's at that time when Moses and Elijah spoke to the Lord Jesus Christ about his exodus, is the Greek word. Uh, and we actually learn that from the Luke account, from Luke chapter 9. But here we're going to go in, straight after that account, into verse 10 of Matthew 17. His disciples asked the Lord Jesus, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all. All things. But I say unto you they, that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So the disciples say, the scribes say that Elijah will come before the Messiah. And Jesus says, they're right. He will. He has a role to restore all things. But speaking of John the Baptist, I think the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here, they've rejected the one who's fulfilling that role. John was a type of Elijah to come. He was working to prepare the Jews to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And that utterly summarizes this work which he has yet to do. Now, if you'll come back now to, to 1 Kings chapter 17, we're going to go into the point where the historical record begins concerning the prophet Elijah. 
And hopefully we can try and, and draw out the fact that the work that Elijah was given to do back here was a preparation for him. And so you'll realize then why we say with absolute confidence that it will be this same Elijah which has got this work still to accomplish. So here in 1 Kings 17, which what we're going to do, knowing full well that we know this record well, we're going to just try and draw out various elements. The first thing I want to show you is here in this chapter, in verse 21 and 22, we see that Elijah brings life to a child through breathing into it. Uh, and so you see at the end of verse 22 that the soul of the child came unto him again and he revived. Now what's particularly interesting about that is that Ezekiel describes the resurrection of a nation by breath being breathed into those dry bones. In fact, that word live that I've highlighted in bold there is the same Hebrew word as revived that you see there in verse 22. We also want to note from this chapter that this took place in Zarephath. And Zarephath means refinement. Uh, interestingly, in Malachi 3, we're told that a messenger will precede the messenger of the covenant. And that is no doubt was sure the work of Elijah. Uh, it says of the Lord Jesus Christ, though, that he will be like a refiner's fire. And in another passage regarding the work of Elijah, we'll go to later in Zechariah 13, you see the same idea coming through. If you turn over to chapter 18 and verse 1, I want you to notice here that Elijah's um, appearance is associated with rain. And I want you to kind of make a note of that, and we're going to see how that applies to later prophecies. I want you to see from verse 19 that at this time on Carmel, when they've got all these problems, Elijah calls out that he wants all Israel to be gathered unto him. And we see that as significant, that Elijah is interested in all Israel. That he is not just interested in the Northern Territory or the Southern Territory. He is looking to work with all Israel. And in a sense, that's backed up a bit more when you look down to verse 31, when he's repairing the altar of the Lord that was broken down and he took 12 stones. And I wonder whether we can connect that idea of him being interested in all Israel with the Lord Jesus Christ saying that he will restore all things. Now, this next passage we want to look at is of huge significance. And I think this will more than ever make you realize, yes, surely this is right. This work is a preparation for him. Just look down to verse 36 now when he says a prayer at this time. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast done what? That thou hast turned their heart back again. And so we, surely that is of such significance to see here he is now, turning the hearts of the children there to the fathers. Just as the uh, prophet Malachi had promised that Elijah's work will involve. You notice then that as the fire then comes down onto the altar, the reaction of the people, and that's described in verse 39. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Yahweh, he is the God. Yahweh, he is the God. Uh, and in a sense, what they're shouting there is Elijah. That is what his name, of course, means. Yahweh is God. Uh, and again, you're going to see the significance of that in latter-day prophecies. As the name Zarephath was significant, so too we think that the names in this chapter have significance. This, of course, took place in Carmel, and Carmel means fruitful field. And again, just take a note, you're going to see the importance of these things later. You see that the chapter ends with Elijah running to Jezreel, and Jezreel means God sows. Again, take note. I, I think it's highly significant that here we see Elijah, as we go into chapter 19 then, uh, actually afraid because of Jezebel uh, and running away from Jezebel. Well, what we're going to see in the future is Elijah going with immortal energy 
no longer afraid of any Jezebel systems, but willing to keep going to save in his teaching. A final idea that you perhaps might like to take out of that chapter 18 is the fact that Elijah, in running ahead of Ahab, in a sense we can then see him as a forerunner to a king. In obviously here a very literal way. But isn't that a lovely idea to think that Elijah will be a forerunner to the ultimate king, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's thrilling. But, but the tragedy, as we've already alluded to, is that at this point in history, uh, Elijah is giving up, believing that only he is left. And so in chapter 19, we see how an angel then sustains him to get into Horeb, to Sinai, to the Mount of God. And it's a journey which takes him some 40 days and nights. Let's go in at verse 7. The angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And as he makes this journey, it, it seems that the Lord God is working to draw Elijah's mind to the experience of Moses. Uh, and the significance of that, we believe in a sense, we've already seen where we saw in Matthew 17 that Moses was with Elijah on the transfiguration. Uh, and there they were talking about an exodus. Moses an exodus from Egypt. The Lord Jesus Christ, he led, led captivity captive, of course. He led the ultimate exodus of bringing people away from the problem of sin. But Elijah has an exodus still to, to come. And again, you will see in latter-day prophecies, just how clear it is that Elijah has an exodus to come. But then as we go into verse 11 of chapter 19, we'll see now Elijah stood on the mount, just as Moses had done, and the Lord God passes by. We read there, he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. We wonder ourselves, why? Why was Elijah put through this? And I wonder if it's for perhaps two reasons, brethren and sisters. The first is perhaps because Elijah is being told by God that dreadful things have got to happen before the sound of gentle stillness. We'll see in a moment as we turn to latter-day prophecies regarding the return of the Jews that momentous events described in terms of earthquake, wind and fire will precede the peace of the kingdom age. The second reason, though, I wonder is because Elijah needs to learn that his role wasn't to be in the dramatic things, but rather as a still, small voice. Through the, the voice power, as we saw John the Baptist, as a voice crying in the wilderness, Elijah will go out and demonstrate to the Jews, showing from Scripture, the law of Moses, Malachi 4, that the Lord Jesus Christ really is the Messiah. So having set that background then, I'd like to return to Malachi chapter 4, please. So in Malachi 4, these words that we've read, we see from verse 5 that Elijah needs to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now we're confident that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is speaking of the events of Armageddon, a huge national judgment in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And, and Brother John has had us thrilled and excited thinking about the events that will lead up to the Russia coming down at, at that time of Armageddon. And so we're, what we're learning here then is that Elijah could be sent before Armageddon actually takes place. Now, the passage also makes clear from the end of verse 6 that Elijah's teaching will avert a curse. Now, what the problem with this is that clearly Armageddon 
is a curse. There in Zechariah 14, that's the same Hebrew word that's used to describe Armageddon. Uh, and So therefore, we can clearly say that Elijah was a curse. Well, there's no way that Elijah's work averts Armageddon. So we're thinking to ourselves, well, well what? what is the curse then that Elijah will actually avert? Well, that same Hebrew word is translated there in 1 Samuel 15 as utterly destroyed. When Saul, as the first king of Israel, was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites. So, I suggest, brethren and sisters, that as the Lord Jesus Christ sets up the kingdom, the land would be utterly destroyed by him if there was no faithful remnant there. If Elijah's teaching hadn't turned a remnant. That, of course, would add to the terribleness of Armageddon, but it would be necessary to purge the land before the setting up of the kingdom. However, because of Elijah's teaching, the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, will return to Jerusalem as a saviour to that remnant. Now, that idea is backed up, I feel, from the citation in um, Romans 9 from Isaiah 1, where it says, Except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, a remnant, we had been as Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, unless there was a remnant in the land, God would utterly destroy Jerusalem and Judah, just as Sodom and Gomorrah had been destroyed. And so, therefore, we'd expect... The Lord Jesus Christ to return to the earth, the resurrection to happen, the judgment must happen, and then Elijah will be sent out to begin his work. And through his teaching of the law of Moses, he'll demonstrate to those Jews who will listen that Jesus really was the Christ, the messenger of the new covenant, the fulfillment of the promises made to the fathers. And his teaching, we believe, will be so powerful that it will turn many Jews in the land. When the judgment of Armageddon comes, therefore, which will be an enormous trial of faith for those Jews, those Jews will then be longing to see the Lord Jesus Christ as their deliverer. And I wonder whether these passages would speak of this event. In fact, I was privileged to be able to see a, um, a, photocopy or a photograph of uh, Brother um, Percy... Um, it's going to, all I want to say is verse by verse Perse, but uh, Mansfield, sorry, how could I forget the name Mansfield in Australia? Uh, so, Brother Percy Mansfield's Bible from Malachi chapter 4, and um, I just was amazed to see the amount of passages that he listed down as being the work of Elijah. And I was thrilled to see the passages which I've worked so hard on this study see and think, yes, he saw this too, he could see this too. Isaiah 40, he put down as that work too. But Isaiah 40 is most certainly about going to Judah. So it struck me that we can be confident to say there could well be this work to Judah first. If you'll now come to Zechariah chapter 12, so just back a book, we'd like to see now this picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to Judah to save So here in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 7, we read that the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. And speaking there of Yahweh, of course, but we recognize the Lord Jesus Christ with the saints as the manifestation of Yahweh will be coming to save the tents of Judah first. And then if you look down the chapter, down to verse 10, you'll see this description now of the genuine tears of repentance as they look to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. It says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Uh, And the remainder of this chapter then goes on to show just how genuine they are. You know, sometimes when you're in a huge big crowd, you can be caught up in the emotion of a situation, can't you? But this isn't how it is here. Just look down to the, the next couple of verses. Verse 12. The land shall mourn, every family apart. This is not some mourning that's just coming from national emotion. 
every family apart. This is genuine upset as the Jews now for years have got this wrong. Now seeing the Lord Jesus Christ, one who is coming to save. Imagine this situation, brethren and sisters. Imagine this situation. No wonder they mourn every family apart, recognizing what they have been a part of for these years. But having been instructed from the Lord, now they can see his love as he comes to save them. Well, truly, that is an expression of the grace of God. What an amazing time that will be. And you know, brothers and sisters, I say with absolute confidence that we will be there to see that. To turn over to chapter 13. It's incredible to read chapter 13 now in verse 9 and think that through those terrible judgments that will come in the, the form of Armageddon, a third part will come through. Why will a third part come through? We believe it's because of the teaching of Elijah. So it says, I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call on my name and I will hear them. And I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, Yahweh is my God. Incredible to think a third part coming through. And I believe that they've been taught. And the reason I believe they've been taught is because the prophet describes them as as being tried as gold. Well, if gold, and I learned this from Sunday school, represents tried faith, then here we've got this idea of faith. Well, where do they get faith from? Faith does not come from thin air. Faith comes from the word of God. And remember, of course, that there in Romans 10, Elijah was, it specifically said that how can they hear except without a preacher? We'll go there in a moment. And so we're confident to say that teaching must have gone on. Now, some say that faith is here because Jesus and the saints have come and they'll start teaching from the word. Well, I don't want to be rude, but that seems a bit late to me. Uh, Faith surely needs to be developed. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So for them to have faith, surely they must have been prepared by one who was teaching them from the word. Now you remember when Elijah turned the people at Carmel, they called out, Yahweh, he is my God. And see now, right at the end of verse of chapter 13, in verse 9, this same cry. They shall say, Yahweh, he is my God, Elijah. Why are they saying that? Well, I believe it's because teaching has taken place. Come back to chapter 10. Zechariah chapter 10. Verse 1. And this is a very, very helpful chapter. And in our time together, we're going to hopefully be able to open up most of this chapter. Ask ye of the Lord, rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone in the field. Now what we notice then, and these first few verses right down to verse 6, is all about what's going on with Judah, the Jews in the land. And what we notice is that rain is going to come to them. Well rain, we have absolute confidence to associate with Elijah, 1 Kings 18 verse 1, And what's more, what is rain? Well, Deuteronomy 32, my doctrine, my teaching shall drop as the rain, as the showers, as it describes here in chapter 10. So so we get this idea then that teaching has gone on. And that is why I suggest that we see them described as gold in Zechariah 13. That here are ones who are faithful, that have come through the trials um, because of the teaching of Elijah. Brother John Thomas, in his little book, uh, The Mystery of the Covenant of the Holy Land Explained, wrote, As far then as faith is concerned, the qualification of the candidate for justification of faith is unexceptionable. Nobody is going to come into the new covenant by any other means. The only means of salvation, which has been true all the way through history, is the Lord God wants faith. The just shall live by faith. And in that little book, which is a wonderful little book and I highly recommend it to anybody, Brother Thomas outlines in there the work which Elijah will have to do with the the Jews who are scattered around the world. We don't doubt one moment his teaching there. 
But, but we believe that he, he wouldn't ignore the fact that there are now 7 million Jews in the land as well when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And so many brethren, and I would be one of them, feel that there could, be well, uh, could well be a work with Judah, those Jews who are in the land too. And this really is what we've described so far. Now, it would be wrong. This is not a first principle for me to be standing up here being dogmatic. Sometimes I come across dogmatic because I get excited and my voice goes up. But, um, you know, this is not something to, to fall out about. But I just, for me, it would have been dishonest in my study of this to stand up and, and not suggest that there is a work with Judah too. And so here are some of the things that we've tried to think about. The Lord Jesus Christ says that Elijah will restore all things. Elijah called all Israel and used 12 stones. Malachi 4 was first addressed to Judah. The principle of faith, this is the most important part of it all to me. The faith comes from the word and a preacher is needed. Romans 9 has spoken of there being a, a remnant. We thought about that, quoting Isaiah 1, which was to the Jews who were in Jerusalem. John was a type of Elijah's work. He was in Judah, preaching as a voice. Zechariah 10, it's to Judah to begin with. Zechariah 13, they're described uh, as gold. And uh, Isaiah 40, we haven't uh, had time to look there, but lovely passages, I put one on the screen for you. Um, and Isaiah 30, I haven't put that in, but I just wanted to put that up there because uh, without me reading that at all in preparation for this study, I read that and their brother Graham Pierce in the Bible magazine from July this year shows this idea of work to Judah purely from looking at Isaiah 30. So we don't think it's unfair to suggest that there could well be this work. But possibly the greatest reason for it all is this principle that faith comes from the word. So to come now to, to Romans. Romans 9, 10 and 11 are chapters all about the restoration of Israel. And you'll see as you scan through them, just how important this principle of their needing to be faith is. Let me just drag out a couple of verses here. The end of verse 33. Whosoever of chapter 9, sorry, Romans 9, verse 33. Whosoever believeth on him, whoever's got faith, shall not be put to shame. Verse 11 of chapter 10. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So you see this emphasis that's being put on the need for belief, for faith. Uh, and then what we read in verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's this Im hugely important principle that they, there needs to be this teaching from the word of God to cultivate faith. And as it says at the end of verse 14, how shall they hear without a preacher? And so we think that there is a lot of evidence to suggest that this faith that is in the land comes from this teaching from the word. We'd like to put our minds now, though, to thinking about this work with Israel, with the Jews who are scattered. The Lord Jesus Christ has said that Elijah will come and restore all things. And, of course, when he returns, there still will be many Jews who are living outside of Jerusalem, all over the world. And so perhaps before even the Lord Jesus Christ comes to Jerusalem to save them, Elijah could be sent on with others were sure to begin that work. And the word no doubt will spread as they're teaching around the world and, and those who are genuine will be converted. And so scattered Jews who are living around the world will be returning to the land of their fathers because of this work. And Exodus will begin. As those Jews scattered around the world begin to return, we'll see that many Gentiles will want to be associated with them, realizing there's life in the hope of Israel. If you look at chapter 11 now of Romans, we'll notice that in this most famous of chapters regarding the restoration of Israel, it begins by drawing our minds to Elijah, there in verse 2, and right down to um, verse, verse 5. But, of course, there it's talking about when Elijah was giving up. We are thinking about, in a beautiful way, how Elijah will be involved in a restoration of Israel. If you just look down to verse 12, I want you to really see the importance of this, how that the preaching to the Jews will be of great, great benefit to the Gentiles. It says there in verse 12, If the fall of them, i.e. of the Jews, be the riches of the world, 
and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. How much more their fullness. So what it's saying there is the Jews uh, converting and coming into the new covenant will be of huge benefit to the Gentiles. They will want to be involved too. Now, what we're in this chapter, I want to point out that verse 8 of Romans 11 is a citation from Isaiah 29. Now, obviously, seeing that being cited in, in Romans 11 tells us that Isaiah 9 must be a chapter regarding the restoration of Israel. It's being cited here in Romans 11. So we'd like to go back to Isaiah 29 and try and bring out some ideas from it. Now, the passage that was quoted in Romans 11, verse 8, is in verse 10 of Isaiah 29. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. So Israel at currently, and still of course now is, asleep, blind to the teaching of Scripture. But look now, verse 17 and 18, we're looking to the restoration now. Is it not yet a very little while? And Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field. And the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. And the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. And here then is this lovely picture. And I believe this is a picture of Elijah's work. Why does Lebanon interest us? Well, Lebanon is where Elijah began his work in 1 Kings 17. And, and, and that word fruitful field, it shall be turned into a fruitful field. I hope that you're able to twig that that's the word Carmel in the Hebrew. And this is the work of Elijah, turning blind Israel. Uh, and now look how, remember his work is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Look now at the end of this chapter, how the fathers are now looking to the children. Verse 22, therefore thus saith the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. But when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. What a lovely picture that is. But we're not mistaken to think that terrible events haven't also happened in the vicinity of Judah and Jerusalem. Just look back to verse 6. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder, with earthquake, with great noise, with whirlwind, and tempest, and the flame of devouring fire, and the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, another word for Jerusalem, the line of God, even all that fight against her and her munition and the distresser, they shall be as a dream of a night vision. The events of Armageddon were terrible judgments, described in the terms of earthquake, wind and fire. But as the Lord Jesus Christ is working to establish Jerusalem now as the capital city of God's kingdom on earth, Elijah and a company of messengers are working to turn scattered Israel. If you go back to Zechariah chapter 10 now, please. This passage I've just found to be of such immense help in this study. And one of the reasons is because this is one of the chapters that really helps us see this clear distinction between the Jews who live in the land in Judah and those Jews who are scattered. So in the, the beginning of this chapter, we've already had a look at verse 1. We get this idea then that this teaching will take place, the rain will come. And that will help in the conversion of Judah. But then, uh, as we go through from verse 3 down to verse 6, you'll see the, the, what's going to happen as a result of that teaching. My anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I will uh, punish the goats. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. So you see, what's happening now is Judah, having been visited by the Lord God, those who have converted are now joining with the saints and the Lord Jesus Christ in the battle against the enemies of Israel. 
For out of him, verse 4, came forth the corner, out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. And they, Judah, shall be his mighty men, which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight, because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be confounded. And I will strengthen the house of Judah. And so the remnant of Judah is now converted. The Lord Jesus Christ has, has saved them from the northern invader. And though we don't have time to go into it, I'm not saying for a moment that that just happens like that. There's terrible events that happen to them and, and many end up scattered out of the city uh, and many will have to join Israel in, in walking back to the land of Israel. But there will be some there who are, are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ and able to work in that uh, battle against the enemies of Israel. But now we're going to look and see this lovely idea of the way in which um, Israel is now going to be brought back to the land. So here we now, halfway through verse 6, and you'll notice that Israel, the Jews who are scattered, are sometimes referred to as Joseph, sometimes as Ephraim. Here we go. I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again, for I will have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I, the Lord their God, I am the Lord their God, sorry, and will hear them. And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their hearts shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. And I will sow them among the people. In other words, they'll be brought into the land and put round the land of Israel. And they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children, shall turn again. So we get this lovely idea of them being brought back into the land. And that idea there of, uh, in verse 8, I will hiss for them, is the idea of a shepherd whistling, calling for his sheep. And so as sheep that are willing to return, so too scattered Israel will be willing to return to the land. The phrase in verse 9, and I will sow them among the people, is a lovely, lovely picture of this restoration. And our margins, I hope they will anyway, will have a cross-reference there to Hosea 2. And I'd like to come back, we're going to come back again to Zechariah 10, but come back now to Hosea 2. And um, goodness me, brothers and sisters, if I can't get you excited in Hosea 2, then I don't know what's going to get you excited, because studying this chapter absolutely thrilled me to see Elijah's work going on in here. So here in Hosea 2, we're going to go in, first of all, at verse 12. So the Lord God, speaking about Israel, says, I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. And isn't it interesting that the one person that we know in Scripture who wanted the rewards of vineyards was Ahab, the very king Elijah had to battle with. And it was given to him by his lover, Jezebel. Isn't that just so interesting there, to see those echoes straight away in verse 12? These are my rewards, vineyards, that my lovers have given me. Surely echoes to Ahab and Jezebel. Well, let's keep going now. We're going to go down at verse 14, and we're going to read a real chunk before coming back and trying to bring out some ideas. Hosea 2, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shalt call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Baalim out of her mouth and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of the heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day. I will hear, saith the Lord. I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. 
And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. There's so much here, brethren and sisters. We've seen the idea of God sowing from Zechariah 10. We've seen the idea that Jezreel means God will sow. The place that Elijah gave up, is being turned by God into something incredible uh, as people are now being brought into the new covenant. And we know that this is talking of the new covenant. There's no doubt it can only be talking of the new covenant because one, it's one that will last forever. We can, we can read that in verse 19. I'll betroth thee unto me forever. Well, that hasn't happened. This is work still to come. And secondly, it's in faithfulness, verse 20. Uh, that uh, passage that I've put on the screen is to connect... The idea of righteousness and judgment there in verse 19 with the seed of Abraham, the true seed of Abraham in Genesis 18 and verse 19 that we won't turn there now. You see that the valley of Achor is turned into a door of hope, verse 15. Well, your margin will tell you that Achor means troubling. And what's interesting about that is, remember, Ahab accused Elijah of troubling Israel. And Elijah says, no, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you've forsaken the commandment of the Lord, and you followed Balaam. Well, now look at verse 13. I will visit upon her the days of Balaam. So here are these echoes back to the work of Elijah time and time again. You'll see in verse 14 where it says that I'll bring her into the wilderness. And in a sense, it's such a shame. There's so much we could bring out about the idea of the wilderness. We think of John as the voice in the wilderness. There's passages in Revelation 17. There's passages in Ezekiel 20 that speak about the wilderness. But, but I want you to just notice the fact that the idea of speaking comfortably, your margin will tell you, means speaking in the Hebrew to the heart. And remember that Elijah's work is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers. You see from verse 15, right at the end of verse 15, that is, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. You see, it's an exodus that is going on here, that they, as they're coming from these far off lands. You'll realize as well from verse 18, and this one is a stunner. You see in verse 18, that the Gentiles are involved. And you might look at that and say, well, how on earth could we possibly say the Gentiles are involved? Well, we say it with confidence because that's the exact list of things that we see in Acts chapter 10 when Peter saw that sheep being lowered down and it was full of the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, the creeping things of the ground to show him that he should be prepared to go to preach to the Gentiles. And so no wonder we see then the fact that how much more their fullness from Romans 11 and verse 12. The Jews coming in will be of great benefit to the Gentiles. And so we read in passages like Zechariah 8, that in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even take hold of him, the scourge of him that is a Jew, saying, we'll go with you. We've heard that God is with you. And so the Gentiles are benefiting now from this teaching and preaching that's going on to the Jews scattered around the earth. They too want to come back and be associated with the hope of Israel. And Isaiah 56 verse 6 and 7 says exactly the same thing. God will plead with his people through the work of the prophet Elijah. Those who respond will join an exodus heading to the promised land where they'll be brought into the new covenant. And you remember how that in 1 Corinthians 10, The apostle there describes the national baptism of Israel into Moses. Well, it could be that something similar will take place now in this exodus. Come back with me again to chapter 10 of Zechariah. We left off in verse 9. But look now at the remainder of this chapter. I will bring them again, verse 10, Zechariah 10, verse 10. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, for place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves of the sea. And all the deeps of the Nile, the RV says there, shall dry up 
and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. And I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. And so we see then that the initial territory that was promised to Abraham, from the Nile to the Euphrates, is now established as the the kingdom territory, which will, of course, as the millennium keeps going through that thousand years, expand and expand and expand until the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. But here is the initial territory. And these Jews that are coming are having to cross either over the Nile or over the Euphrates to come into the land. And we get this lovely idea of them almost being baptized as they come into the new covenant. And as at the first exodus, they'll be given safe passage. And we read about that in in Isaiah 11. The Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river. And shall smite it in the seven streams. And shall make men go over dry shot. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people. Which shall be left from Assyria. Like as it was to Israel in the day when he came up out of the land of Egypt. We see why Elijah was there at the transfiguration with Moses and the Lord Jesus Christ talking about the Exodus. And that highway, we learn more of, don't we? Isaiah 35, the highway that shall be there, the way, it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. And so we get this lovely idea of these Jews who are coming, and no doubt they'll be coming through some terrible circumstances as they travel now, Back to the land of their fathers. And then as they come in, they'll be brought into the new covenant. And given places to live. And and Ezekiel gives us the idea of whereabouts they'll be placed in the land. With of course the twelve apostles now ruling over them as judges in that time. Uh, And one more thing that I'd like you to note from Zechariah 10. Which again, I, I just absolutely love. As we read here that they'll be brought into the land of Gilead and Lebanon. And do you know what's so stunning about this? And, you know, I can't tell you how each time when you see something like this, it just either sends tingles up on your spine or you feel the need to get up and have a dance around the room. It's just amazing. To me, it was anyway. Gilead. We've seen the importance of Lebanon. Why are they being brought to Gilead? Gilead was where Elijah was from. Elijah the Tishbite. One of the inhabitants of Gilead. And there we know Gilead means witness. It's a scriptural definition. That's what it means. Of course, in all this is a witness. No wonder the nations get involved in this. Here is God's witness. Israel is God's witnesses. And Elijah has this wonderful work outlined for him in helping to bring the Jews into the new covenant. And so we truly believe that Elijah will come and restore all things. There are so many more passages that we should love to turn to, but I know that I'll have to answer to Auntie Lorna if I keep going, so I won't. But, but we could go to Jeremiah 3. We could go to Jeremiah 30 and Jeremiah 31. Stunning passages about this. You could go to Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel 37. So many more passages, brethren and sisters. But each of them show this wonderful work which is yet to happen. But I want us to finish now and to try, as we said at the beginning, to take some lessons for our lives. You see, when Elijah first spoke to Israel, he said to them, How long halt ye between two opinions? The hope of Israel is our hope. It's what distinguishes us from any other denomination in the world. May we be amongst those who respond, Yahweh, he is our God. And in the challenge of our lives, may we live by faith. Hold on. Believe that God, our God, is in control. And if you're struggling to see it in your own life, and of course sometimes we do get bogged down and things can seem very challenging, then look to the example of Israel. Look to them in history to see God's guiding hand. How is it that they have kept going as a people? See the evidence of God's existence in them. Look to them in the future to see that Israel, arrogant Israel, God's grace will extend to. 
Brethren and sisters, God's grace is sufficient for you and for me. In our preaching, may we remember that it's not about the dramatic. We don't need to be going out and trying to think, well, how can we do God's marketing for him? What an insult! Our role is to be a voice proclaiming the word of God. That is preaching. Never, ever forget that God's word is the source of our faith. And so, when you think about that, that huge scriptural statement in Romans 10 and verse 17, surely that's a challenge to each one of us. How much time will you give to it? And you have to answer that as an individual, as a family, as an ecclesia. How much time? Will you give to the word of God? Nowhere else is it going to come from. This is what's going to keep us going until the Lord Jesus Christ is back. And finally, brethren and sisters, Elijah's mortal life, we've seen, was a preparation for his work in the kingdom. We can't say this for sure at all. This is speculation now. But I wonder, is ours? And so at times when we might feel like letting go, we might struggle to hold on and keep on going. Because the Lord God is working with you and with me. What he started in us, he will complete. And perhaps when we are brought into the kingdom by his grace, the Lord Jesus Christ might show us and be able to say, that time in your life, I kept you going there. My angels were working with you. And now I want you to use that experience as you go out and preach in that kingdom age. Brothers and sisters, that is what we pray for more than anything else, wherever in the world we are. That is our prayer, that the Lord Jesus Christ will come soon.